Okay, got a pretty good crowd already. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us, welcome. Um, this is going to be our panel discussion entitled Collecting the Future of the Museum. Um, my name is Marjorie Rawl. I am the Associate Gallery Director of Assembly. Um, we're so excited to be hosting this discussion as part of the programming for our exhibition, Collecting the Future, Photography and Generative Art on the Blockchain, um, which we are presenting in partnership with Artblocks, the leading platform for bringing compelling works of generative art uh, to the blockchain. Um, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, um, please come by. It's on view until July 22nd. Um, and today, our panelists are the leading voices for collecting and preserving digital art at major museums. Um, and they will be exploring the institutional perspective on collecting NFTs um, and how their visions and practices are adapting to this new medium. Um, I am just going to be offering some very brief introductions to all the panelists, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to them for the discussion. Um, our moderator today is Hesse McGraw. Since early 2020, McGraw has served as the 10th Executive Director of the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston, one of the oldest non-collecting contemporary art museums in the United States. He is a curator, writer, cultural leader, and passionate advocate for the essential role of artists in advancing society. He began his career in Kansas City 20 years ago and most recently served as partner of the cross-disciplinary architecture practice El Dorado Inc. as vice president for exhibitions and public programs at San Francisco Art Institute and chief curator of Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, America Marisa Castillo is a project manager and curatorial liaison for advanced technologies at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Um, in her role, she supports the museum's accessions program across all collecting departments. Most recently, she's led the acquisition of nine NFTs for the permanent collection, including works by artists like Lynn Hirschman Leeson and Alejandro Cartagena. Together with a cross-disciplinary group of collection specialists and technologists, she developed a process through which the organization could properly and sustainably steward NFT art long-term, a working model which can be applied to other technologies, including AI-based works. Um, next up, we have Anthony Troisi. He is the Director of Finance and Operations at the Institute of Contemporary Art Miami. Prior to joining ICA Miami, Anthony spent over 20 years working in commodities and finance between New York and Miami. Um, as an avid supporter of the arts and technology, Anthony was invited to spearhead the museum's innovation and digital assets projects alongside the museum's artistic director, Alex Gartenfeld. Um, and last but not least, we've got Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan. Um, is a, she is a renowned expert on the history of media art. As curator at the Buffalo AKG Art Museum, her exhibitions include 2022's Peer to Peer, the first US museum survey of artists engaged with blockchain technologies, and with Paul Van Nuys, 2021's Difference Machines, Technology and Identity in Contemporary Art, which received an award for excellence uh, from the Association of Art Museum Curators. Um, her recent publications include reviews of LACMA's exhibition Coded and MoMA's exhibition Signals for Art Forum. Um, and she has received an Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant, was named to Artnet's 2022 Innovators List, and holds degrees in art history from Harvard and Columbia. Uh, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, just one quick reminder to the audience that there will be some time for questions at the end. Um, so please use the Q&A function throughout the talk. Um, and I can select a few at the end to read uh, to our panelists. Um, that is all from me, Hesse. Uh, feel free to take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for bringing together this incredible group. And it's wonderful to see such great attendance. Um, you know, it's amazing when you can see the attendees list and we can see their names. So we know we know who's here, but great to have you all. Um, you know, first, Tina, I just want to thank you for, for being here. I mean, you're in the midst of a massive reopening for Buffalo AKG. So, you know, reopening and rebranding. So thanks for taking the time out 
to, to join us. And we're all looking forward to seeing that extraordinary new building and museum there. So looking forward to that. Um, wanted to start by, you know, really asking you, I mean, you've been one of the most prominent and vocal museum curators thinking about the possibilities and opportunities of digitally native work. And you've said the future is being drafted. So just wanted to begin by asking if you could bring us up to speed on your current and evolving thinking about the museum's role today in supporting and presenting digital artwork. Hi, um, it's a great question. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, as you mentioned, the Buffalo AKG Art Museum is currently uh, in the midst of our um, opening events for our inaugural season uh, as the Buffalo AKG, formerly the Albert Knox Art Gallery. It's a 162 year old museum that has always been dedicated to contemporary art, the art of its time. Um, Founded in 1862, the first work it acquired was a painting from 1859. So always a museum of contemporary art. And I mentioned that as my preamble to answering your question. <laughs> so, um, you know, th this institution um, back in 1910 actually hosted the very first museum exhibition of photography, as far as we know. Um, it was guest curated by Alfred Stieglitz and the Photo Secession. Um, and so there was this moment in 1910 where, you know, we invited um, the sort of leading advocates for photography as a fine art, not just a scientific instrument, not a tool um, uh, for scientific research or something like that, but um, uh, as a, a, a medium, as an artistic medium, um, to come into this space and to install photographs on our walls, in our galleries that traditionally exhibited painting and sculpture. And so this exhibition in 1910, I think we can point to as a moment in which uh, the fine art world, uh, you know, really began to accept and understand photography as a creative tool. And of course, this was an ongoing process. It's not like, you know, this exhibition, you know, overnight led to photography's acceptance as a medium. And this is not to say that there weren't steps that were taken before 1910, um, on that path, but uh, we, we can certainly say that, you know, museum exhibitions are a kind of indicator, right, of how certain artistic movements um, are being seen by the traditional art establishment, right? Um, and so I think, you know, right now what, um, I mean, I, I'm torn between wanting to speak about this institution in specific and museums more broadly, but maybe let me just speak about this institution in specific. Um, so here at the Buffalo AKG, we really pride ourselves on not only supporting artists working with emerging technologies, but also um, helping to define the movements on the horizons of contemporary art, right? So another example of this is, you know, we acquired an Andy Warhol painting in 1962, which is, the year that basically Andy Warhol becomes a fine artist, right? Um, so being at the very moment of the sort of explosion of pop art in America, acquiring a work by him when frankly Andy Warhol, you know, six months earlier was basically still a graphic designer and illustrator, commercial illustrator, right? So we see it as our responsibility as an institution devoted to modern and contemporary art. Um, it's our responsibility to sort of have our antenna out and to see what's on the horizon and to help make legible, right? To sort of contextualize, um, uh, to, to provide you know, historical and social context to new artistic movements as they're emerging. So um, you know, this is work that we're continuing to this day. I guess what I'm trying to say is that our work with NFTs is not something that just sort of came out of nowhere or that we're interested in NFTs just for NFT sake, right? We're interested in this larger project of always being um, sort of at the cutting edge and defining what's coming next. And so, um, you know, this is true with digital art, but it's also true with contemporary painting, with contemporary photography, right? This is our approach to all um, of contemporary art. So um, 
I will wrap up by saying that uh, just yesterday, I believe, uh, there was an article published by Andra Shanto and Thomas Campbell. Um, so Thomas Campbell, the leader of um, the Fine Arts Museums in San Francisco, um, and Andra Shanto is a, um, a sort of very prominent consultant um, who has now written two books about the future of museums. Um, in which they basically say, um, you know, exactly what I think, but haven't really written down anywhere, or, you know, if I have, I've forgotten, <laughs> um, uh, which is that, you know, I mean, their take on it is that museums, like, let's be real, right? Like Silicon Valley is this giant machine and museums aren't going to necessarily completely direct the future of technology, right? Like that's not something that's within our power. But uh, as you mentioned, Hessa, you know, I have written and said that um, I think we do have the opportunity to be a space that is a nonprofit space in which emerging technologies can be tested and contested, right? Like we are a space, like art is a space in which the, the sort of public imagination um, is made manifest by artists and through our public programming. And so it's a space where we can have these debates. It's a kind of, I mean, I hate to use this word because it's so charged, but it's a kind of safe space, right? Where we can have these conversations and work this stuff out. Um, that's not a space that, you know, is, uh, it's just different than a conference, you know, that's like um, a dev conference hosted by a Silicon Valley company, right? Um, and it's different than an academic institution where the audience is primarily academic, right? This is a space where we can have a public dialogue about technology. Um, and I think that that's, you know, an important um, opportunity, even a responsibility, right, that we bear as nonprofit institutions that operate in the public trust. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it's a really great intro. And we might come back to the question around public trust. But I'd like to pick up on an earlier thread, which was, you know, sort of thinking about um, the first museum exhibition of photography all the way to the, you know, more recently, the first exhibition of digitally generated work, which was, you know, tied to works in your collection, um, the through the peer to peer exhibition. Can you talk about, you know, how that aided the education efforts within the museum as it relates to sharing this new technology and you know, bringing an audience into that dialogue. Sure, and I, I just wanna clarify, it wasn't our first exhibition of digital art. Um, digital art is something that we've been acquiring right. for a long time now. So right. this was our first exhibition. And as far as I know, the first US museum survey of artists who work with blockchain technologies, um, which is basically NFTs, right? <laughs> um, NFTs smart contracts. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, we, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I well, got, I, you know, it's just, it's interesting that uh, Buffalo AKG or the precursor Albright Art Gallery presented the first exhibition of photography in 1910. And then, you know, last year, two years ago, Peer to Peer was the first exhibition of first survey of blockchain art. US. Tell us US. how that, yeah, thank you. Tell us how that tied into your education efforts to share more about this new emerging form. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Um, so, um, I mean, every exhibition has a pedagogical aspect, right? Every exhibition, a curator is essentially making an argument to the public about, um, an idea uh, about an artist and the trajectory of their career, about a group of artists. Um, and so, you know, this exhibition, because it would be the first encounter, the first point of contact of certainly our audiences in Buffalo, for the most part, with this sort of digitally native arts community, um, this exhibition was really meant to be a kind of general survey or overview of the different possibilities of digital art within this particular ecosystem. So um, there are other exhibitions that are happening now, and I'm so glad to see it, that are focusing more on artists who use blockchain as a creative medium. 
Um, there are exhibitions that are focusing specifically on generative art, right? So there's, you know, there's there are ways to make a sort of tighter curatorial argument, but sometimes you just need a very broad survey that just gives people the general contours, right, of what is possible. So I wanted this exhibition to include, yes, abstract generative art, but also figurative art, also conceptual art. I wanted it to include work that is, um, you know, that are like still PNG files, as well as movie files, as well as interactive games, as well as smart contracts, right? So really just sort of helping people understand the variety of approaches within this space, because I think that what happened immediately with the NFT conversation in the mainstream art world and even popular culture more broadly was there was this kind of flattening where NFTs was people, it was CryptoPunks and it was Bored Apes. And I know ICA Miami is on the call, so like no shade to the CryptoPunks, right? But I'm just saying like, um, it, they're because of those high profile acquisitions, right? Because of the ICA Miami jumping in and getting a crypto punk, and I think being the first US museum to acquire an NFT, you know, it, there was a sort of association that this is what this stuff looks like. And so I wanted in our exhibition to say, well, yes, it can be a, a JPEG file that, you know, is attached to a smart contract, but it can also be a game that an artist completely builds from the ground up, the way Mitchell Chan did with his game. Um, Winslow Homer's Croquet Challenge, where he's even designing his own custom shaders, right? And then when you buy the work of art, um, you actually are getting a fully executable software program. And so I, you know, I, I, I wanted to sort of say that there's all these other possibilities for what digital art can be. And for some of these projects, the NFT is an integral component of it. And for others of these projects, it's really not. Right. But just to say that digital art is a much bigger conversation um, than, you know, just the blockchain even um, or just these kinds of you know JPEG assets. So that was really the educational com component in my mind. Right? It was like making sure people understood that there was a broader story um, happening um, when people really had only seen just like the highlights. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of thinking about the broader story, a question for about SFMOMA's recent acquisition. So uh, many in the audience may know that earlier this year, SFMOMA acquired their first NFT work, which was actually a work by Lynn Hirschman Leeson. Lynn is a renowned Bay Area artist with a very long relationship to the museum. And I, I was excited, America, to see that announcement, particularly because Lynn is known as an artist who has continually explored new media since the 1960s. And 20 years ago, her work, Agent Ruby, was among SFMOMA's first online acquisitions. So can you talk about that lineage and what it means to draw this kind of through line within the museum's collection that spans an artist's exploration of new media across a decades-long career? Absolutely. I think to me that I think there's two aspects about it in terms of how we arrived at a decision, not just of like, do we want to acquire an NFT, but which one in particular, one of it has to do, you know, regardless of the artist's practice and this conceptual philosophical conversation that Tina is kind of talking about of, you know, digital art as a whole and being at the cutting edge, I think from a pragmatic point of view, we just wanted to make sure that our first NFT collaboration, because that's really what it is, right? We wanted to make sure that it was with an artist that would allow us that flexibility to be in conversation and continue to learn about this NFT, not see it necessarily as like a milestone that we would want to check off of saying like, we want to be this museum, the first one, or we just want to cross off the first NFT in the collection, but to really treat it as a I don't, I hesitate to call it like a case study, but like an experiment in some ways to really continue, commit to continuing 
the learning process about the NFT, about how we catalog it, about how we preserve it, about how we display it. And so one of the aspects on a more superficial level was really, you know, choosing to work with an artist that, you know, Lynn has a history of also, you know, adapting and reframing her work in context as technologies evolve. And so we were really interested in that ability to continue to talk with her. The other aspect of it that is a little bit more philosophical um, had to do with questions of uh, technology in general and how we actually um, decide to engage in the space in a way that's not necessarily reactive, but more intentional. So obviously, as Tina mentioned, um, especially in like 2020 and 2021, there was so much speculation and a lot of artists that were relatively new to the space, a lot of them that were, you know, working for the first time in that market or in that medium or in digital art in general, like for many young artists, NFTs was their entry foray into, into the space as well. And so we actually, to try to cut through the noise, we said there's a lot of artists out there that I'm sure are going to be really exciting to have works in the collection and to collect, but it probably makes more sense to start with our own community rather than trying to go out and create a new one or foster relationships with people who don't have that pre-existing relationship with us, why don't we try to look inward and look at the community that we already have, those relationships that we have um, set forward because we already see ourselves as stewards of these artworks and as representatives of those artists that are already in the collection. And so we, this actually started, um, this is like a weird fun fact, but our engagement in the NFC space started not necessarily in collecting artwork, but it started in the fundraising aspect, and it was also with Lynn. So a lot of people don't know that um, the NFT that came into the collection is actually an edition of two. So we acquired the edition, the second edition, but the first edition was actually auctioned at our largest fundraising event, Art Bash, in April of 2021. And so it wasn't until December of 2022 that we formally acquired the second edition. And our agreement from then, um, even at the beginning with Lynn, was that, that we were going to have her mint two NFTs and that the first one was going to benefit the museum in this particular way. And the second one was going to benefit us in terms of research and, and collecting practices. And so all that is to say... <laughs> basically that because we started in a different space in this fundraising aspect, we, we did it very, very calculated, not in a manipulative way, but we were very intentional about how we wanted to engage with uh, NFTs, obviously knowing that as the, you know, the space would grow, there would be more emerging artists that we would want to collaborate with. And I think we were kind of chatting about this before the, the webinar started, but um, we actually decided to to do as much as we could in house because there was a lot a lot that was going on in the, in the world and a lot of consultants and uh, people who were obviously naturally trying to make a business a, a, of this and engage with nonprofits and um, you know museums organizations of all kinds and trying to kind of offer services that would allow them to not worry about these details, but we were really focused from the beginning that if we are really going to steward, much like we did with Agent Ruby, and we still talk about Agent Ruby, we still need to um, figure out how to conserve, uh, do conservation work or media conservation specifically, or do research projects about that. We want to continue to do that with every artwork in our collection. And so we wanted to be able to set ourselves up internally, which was the very difficult path <laughs> And it had very many challenges that we're still facing, but I think it was the right one because we, knowing how the sausage is made, allowed us to actually be able to um, have a workflow that's sustainable and also feel secure that we're not just bringing in something in the collection to say that we have it. We're bringing it in as a as a true commitment to making sure that we can care for this you know, 10 years time and 20 years and 50 years and 100 years even, regardless of whether blockchain technology um, is still here or whether we are here, you know, with the expertise that we've gathered. And so making it not dependent on individuals, which is something that's a really, it's a whole other conversation, but it's like very, a big problem in museums <laughs> in general. It's, it's, it's great. Thank you. And I, you know, that question of you know, posterity and and really, in a sense, digital humanities. I think is obviously at the at the core of 
all of our thinking around this emergence. But it, you know, Anthony, if I could ask you, I mean, it, I see in Miami became the first major museum to collect NFT following a donation of CryptoPunk fifty two ninety three. It, you know, if you in could, the US. sorry, in the U.S. Thank you. Um, yeah, apologies to those uh, those who may be calling in from elsewhere. You know, we're we're pretty jingoistic here. But um, Anthony, if you could share how that acquisition was determined, and then you know how it was received. Talk us through actually the accessioning of that work into the collection. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. So um, I think um, that was one of the most difficult parts of uh, of the uh, you know accessioning the work is is figuring out how to do that and preserve uh, this new digital medium uh, into perpetuity or you know as far out as you can possibly see, right? And and that'll evolve. So I think you know the majority of my time was spent um, establishing a team of of experts across different disciplines. Um, and that, you know, when you look at a physical, tangible artwork, uh, it's we, we've got the best practices for that uh, pretty, pretty set and, uh, and, and patterned. Um, and the same for other digital technologies, um, you know, whether it's, uh, it's film or, um, or, or movies. Um, but when it came to this new technology, uh, the blockchain specifically, um, there wasn't really a clear path or, or some, someone else that we could leverage or lean on to ask how they sort of handled it. So uh, we were sort of paving our, our, our own road as we went. And, uh, and the way we went about that was, was really just looking at how we've handled traditional artworks and trying to mirror that as best as possible for the digital side. Um, so, you know, making the decision if you keep it on hot storage or cold storage obviously was sort of like the first path. And then, you, you know, you figure out which is the most secure and obviously keeping it offline is, is probably the best path, at least in our opinion, it is. Uh, and then from there, now you have to um, you have to see how, how it can be insured. Um, and, and that's sort of a, a complicated process because uh, insurance always needs appraisals and and there wasn't really a clear uh, methodology for how the works are, are appraised. And so we had to work uh, with a specialist in that area as well. Um, so, you know, once we, once we set off and started to, you know, lay the, the foundation uh, step brick by brick, I think we, we finally ended up with a, um, with, with a best practice and, um, and a methodology for how to accession digital artworks or NFTs specifically um, into the future, and that's you know that's changing as as um, you know as, as technologies change or, or uh, new new mediums or methods of storage uh, enter the marketplace. Um, but for now, I think the the um, uh, the methodology and, and process and, uh, and practices that we have in place uh, will serve us well for for the foreseeable future. Thank you for that. And, you know, we could perhaps ask more specific questions, but I'd, I'm also curious about the NFT marketplace that the museum launched in, I guess, 2021. Mm -hmm. It was first launched through a live auction and performance. And I, I wonder if you could share more about that, that event, but then also talk about how that initiative both supports artists and enhances the museum's mission. Of course. So I, I think, um, you know, when I came into the organization, uh, we, we looked at, at blockchain, not just specifically as, you know, for NFTs, but in, in all aspects. Um, we, we also uh, began to accept uh, cryptocurrencies as donations. Um, so, so we had that component. Uh, the NFT marketplace was, was another aspect and also, you know, the, the, um, the NFTs into the permanent collection. So, so we really had, you know, sort of a, a, a broad holistic approach to this technology rather than just a, a singular specific focus. Uh, so the marketplace was just a nat sort of a natural um, component of, uh, you know, of the technology and how we could apply it as an institution um, for both educational purposes, um, 
but but also exposure uh, and, and to leverage uh, the blockchain technology um, in a way that allows you know provenance and, and you know specific identification of uh, you know of the artwork and, and making sure that it is authentic and it comes from the source. Um, so I think you know as an institution, uh, we also have the unique opportunity to introduce uh, both a you know a consumer or a participant and the artist. Um, all of the artists or most of the artists that we showcase are, are traditional in, in all forms. Um, but the technology and, uh, and, and the way that we view it is, is sort of converging. Um, so I think in the future, or at least my perspective looking out into a crystal ball would be that, um, you know, the technology is utilized, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a much more broad uh, spectrum uh, than it currently is. And I think Tina sort of mentioned this as, you know, uh, stating that that the, the smart contracts or the the ledger or the blockchain um, can be used for, for, you know, many purposes. And I, I think that that will be true and will continue to, to evolve. And, um, uh, and that's sort of, you know, the idea with the market prices. Can we bring together um, traditional uh, consumers uh, of art, as well as more digitally native consumers of art, and, and the same from the creators, the creator side, you know, digital native creators, as well as traditional artists. Can we bring those two worlds together and and um, uh, and, and and show the benefits of, of both of these and and show them under the same uh, under the same roof? Um, so I think that was the initial idea. And, and uh, as you mentioned, in, in 2020, 2021, we launched the marketplace for, uh, for our gala as, as sort of a, a fundraiser, but also um, uh, showing what we can do with the technology, um, showing how you can take a, a live performance, uh, then you know, digitize it, put it on the blockchain to, to really educate everyone as to you know as to how expansive this technology could be and how you can take somebody that is uh, mostly a digital native artist at that time it was Corey Van Loo have him do a some you know what what would be more of a traditional performative art uh, and and merge those two together to create one uh, one sort of uh, component of you know under the umbrella of art um, so that was sort of the experiment, um, and it, it, we we took we we learned a lot from from that experimentation. Um, we've continued to internally um, refine and and develop what we think the next uh, frontier of a marketplace could look like for a museum, and and we're currently working on that with the hopes of relaunching soon. So, is the museum actually facilitating the sale of works through the marketplace? Uh, in, in what sense um, are you using the term facilitate? Sorry, just to be to be clear. Well, are, is the marketplace? I mean, are works sold on the marketplace? They are correct. Yeah. So, so that that one in particular was a was a bidding was an auction, uh, and in the future it, it may be a combination of either fixed price or or um, or auction uh, variations. Um, again, the idea I think and one of the benefits of of um, NFTs specifically is with the smart contracts is you have the ability uh, for to provide the artists with essentially what it, what would be like a royalty on resales, right? So uh, I think in traditional art, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, once an artist sells their artwork to a consumer and then that person then resells, whether it's through an auction house or, or private, the artists themselves aren't uh, entitled to any of the, that upside potential. I think with the marketplace, um, you know, as long as it is built into the smart, smart contracts, you do have that that potential. And I think that can create, you know, um, an interesting uh, sort of like revenue stream or, or way to support an artist uh, in, in the future with with their artworks. And I think, you know, I, I uh, everything that the museum does is about spot uh, highlighting and and uh, and shining a spotlight on a particular artist and and obviously um, allowing them to flourish. So I think you know, ideally, uh, the marketplace is really about the art, the art and the artists themselves. Thank you. 
question. You know, Tina, maybe this is a larger question for you. I mean, you know, you've you've shared that you saw um, the museum's engagement with with NFT works, with digitally native works, as part of a larger project and asking what's next. And I, you know, I think it sort of begs the question: How do you do that while at the same time separating the risk of you know being taken in by an overheated market, or at least how do you, you know, navigate through the through the fog that an overheated market can potentially create? Um, <clears throat> well, um, the way that I see it, I mean, it, this is my job. That's what it means to be a curator. Is you know, I'm not an appraiser. I'm not an art dealer. So actually I'm absolutely the wrong person uh, to evaluate an artwork's future financial value. Um, I've never worked at a gallery or on the for-profit side of things, um, but I'm an art historian by training and I'm also an art critic. And as a curator, it's my responsibility to figure out which are the artworks that will retain cultural value into the future. The artworks that um, are culturally significant right now, and we can put in a kind of time capsule that is a museum collection and will help future generations understand what was going on with our culture in this particular moment in time. And yet we'll also hopefully transcend our particular culture and will still speak to audiences in the future and will be resonant with them um, and be, for lack of a better word, timeless. And frankly, and this is something I've been harping on in the NFT space for a couple of years now, there is no necessary core, I mean, connection. I, I almost want to say that there's no correlation. That's not quite true, but, um, you know, between sort of cultural value and financial value. Um, and this is, I think, a common misconception in the NFT space about how museums work. There's this assumption that we basically are just like collecting the artists who have the highest auction value or, you know, who are making the most sales or who show with the blue chip galleries and that those are the people we are exhibiting. And I like to point out, you know, my last exhibition at the museum, which was the um, before peer to peer, um, which was the exhibition Difference Machines um, in 2021. There were 17 artists in that show, and I think two of them have gallery representation, right? So meaning that our curatorial program is not exclusively looking at artists who show with major galleries, right? Um, in fact, it's, uh, you know, in some cases, it's kind of the opposite, right? We're really interested in identifying and, and sort of platforming those artists who we think have important things to say, regardless of whether or not the market is interested in what they have to say. Um, so, sorry, it's like a philosophical answer to your question, but I just wanted to sort of be clear on that because I was sort of reading, or I'm, perhaps I was just concerned that the audience might think that that was sort of, um, you know, that your question was like, well, you know, how do you distinguish? And, um, you know, it's just like the market really doesn't play in like my whole job right is to find out what's good regardless of what price is on it so I just have to trust myself that I'm good at my job basically um and you know the way that you figure that out is basically through um your knowledge of history and through doing it a long time right um that you know historically they're you know all curators you know we love to have these moments where we see an artist for the first time and we fall in love and then you know we get to watch with great pleasure as their careers then grow and take off and um we see them get the recognition and you know perhaps even the paycheck that we think they deserve um but yeah recognizing who those artists are you know and of course it, it, there's no agreement like different curators won't you know 10 curators will have 10 different opinions about you know who those artists should be right um but that's why what we do is so much fun did that answer your question? I'm not sure. Sort of, sort of. But I'd I'd actually invite us to to all you know jump in the mud together. There's mm -hmm. there's a question which is a thorny one. Um, I'm just going to read it. Isn't it a nonprofit museum's responsibility? Wait, sorry. Isn't it not a a 
it is there it's basically a statement it is not a nonprofit museum's responsibility to sell artwork isn't this ethically muddying the waters why is this suddenly okay because of the blockchain why not leave it to galleries platforms and direct sales in the for-profit world so it's a really valid question and it's it's one that on the one hand um speaks to the nonprofit stack you know nonprofit um status of most museums but on the other hand it it actually harkens back to a you know a longer thread of inquiry which is a kind of a contested public dialogue around the relationship between museums and the market and you know Tina because you referenced work on the 62. I mean, he was, you know, the, I mean, we're all said being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art and working as art and good business is the best art. I mean, of course he's, that's kind of a cheeky quote. And he also doesn't say that until later, the concept of business art is not yet then fully formulated in 1962. That's sort of after he sells out and becomes a society portrait painter in the seventies, but yeah. Fair, fair. But, um, you know, I think it's it's maybe a question for Anthony. How do you avoid um, ethically muddying the waters in terms of the museum's role as a nonprofit, which is intended to hold a collection in public trust, versus the the need to generate revenue to fulfill that mission? Sure. No, it, it, it's, a, it's a valid question and a difficult one to answer. I can't say that we have we've, we found the, the answer or the balance yet, which is something that we're, we're obviously continuing to define and work on. Uh, I think there's a, a distinct difference, though, in selling works from the collection, right? So deaccessioning artwork and selling artwork from the collection versus what we're discussing here, which is... Um, highlighting artists through an NFT marketplace and allowing them to create specific works for the museum or, you know, or in, in collaboration with the museum. I think those are, are two very different sort of uh, things. And, 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 and I, I don't want to make, I want to make sure that we, we draw that, that distinction that we're not talking about taking artwork that, that exists in our permanent collection, digitizing it and selling it as sort of a cash grab that that's, that is by no means, um, in the plans or in the foreseeable future of what, what a museum or, or our museum uh, would ever embark on. What we're talking about is, is using a platform and a technology um, and, uh, and, uh, and highlighting the artist and allowing the artist to, to earn in, uh, in revenue streams and, and um, uh, you know, in uh, future revenue, uh, utilizing the technology that they may not otherwise have access to in participation with the museum, um, again, in sort of like in a general broad terms that has yet to be clearly defined or, or completely ironed out. Um, so, so broadly and generally speaking with no specifics uh, yet to be delivered, um, but, but just to clear that, that, you know, make that distinction very clear. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. I can also jump in I, because I agree completely with Anthony and that they are two completely different things. Um, but I think it also points to a larger issue that it sometimes it's it's hard to talk about because it's not so clear where things are going to go. There's you know one day it's NFTs, another day it's AI, and there's the pandemic and all these things. But it's a larger question of what the role of museums really is. And I think um, in the past, I mean. That question also comes from this idea that museums are just static uh, institutions that are meant to acquire work and display them. But I think the way that I think of museums, which aligns a little bit more with the initiatives that the ICA is doing, is to change that completely and see museums as forums and see museums as platforms. How that actually takes place, um, you know, can be in many different ways. I think 
the, you know, a marketplace is definitely one of them, but it could also be a space for education or it could be a space for um, conversation, like what Tina was saying about testing and contesting technologies. So I think, uh, you know, the marketplace can be, the marketplace idea can be contested, but I think it's still a very valid um, prototype of how we can iterate on this idea of what the purpose of a museum is. That said, though, I do want to also acknowledge that there is a power relationship in all of this and that there, there also is issues of equity, especially when we're talking about technology, because at least in the case of SFMOMA, you know, it's a pretty large museum and it also gets to a point where the name SFMOMA has a life of, of its own. There's what we do, there's our programs, our collection, and then there's the SFMOMA brand as well. And so we do have to be careful when we decide which projects and, and case studies to pursue because one thing can be the intention with which we, you know, lead. And another thing could be also the way that a market that is outside of our control uses that to do whatever they want. And in, in this case, it happens a lot in terms of value, um, because it's true that there is not necessarily a correlation between cultural and financial value, but we also can't ignore the fact that if an artwork does enter a collect, let, let's say a collection like SFMOMA, the value of the artist practice is very likely to go up as well. And so that's why we have to be very intentional and make sure that when we decide to acquire something, it's because there is validity in that practice and validity in that cultural context, not just because we see it as potentially, you know, being of interest to certain groups, um, especially in the NFT space, because it's so male dominated. And it's also very white, <laughs> just to call it out. So um, yeah, trying to be careful about that, I think is very important. Thank you. I think we have a hand raised, Patricia. Risk yeah, I'll go ahead and um, unmute you, Patricia, so you can ask your question. Oh, I think she might have unraised her hand. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, there you go. Okay, you should be able to speak, Patricia. Hi, everyone. I apologize. That was a complete fat finger move on my end. So I'll let you all continue the engaging conversation. <laughs> no worries. Oh, Tina, I was just going to ask if you're interested to pick up the conversation from where America left off. Um, well, I feel like it's, you know, uh, it's really the ICA Miami and SF moment away in here because the AKG has no plans to, um, you know, create a marketplace or, or do anything like that. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, <laughs> I feel like I can't really speak to this. Um, I will say that, you know, historically, um, museums have held benefit auctions in which um, artists uh, or, or for which artists are invited to donate works um, that the museum then auctions um, as a fundraiser um, and that that's considered a kind of normal activity. And so, um, you know, I think maybe it's worth asking or I will also point out, like, for example, I used to work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in their gift shop, they sell additioned prints. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that some of them are over four figures. Um, and so I guess the question I have is, you know, to what extent do we see um, some of, you know, these forays? And again, I feel like, I'm, you know, I don't know if it's my place to answer, but, um, you know, to what extent do we see this as being similar to that or different than that? Um, and then finally, I'll just say that, you know, there are governing bodies that um, accredited museums have to answer to, um, not to mention the IRS. In, in terms of our activities, they limit the scope of our ability to, to participate in commercial for-profit activities. So, um, uh, you know, for the Buffalo AKG, for example, you know, we fundraise um, and there's lots of different ways that that looks like, um, but, you know, there's a kind of limit and I'm not the right person to answer this question, but um, I know that our CFO would say that there's, you know, 
that there's sort of rules about how much of this kind of stuff we could possibly engage in. And I think that, you know, again, I'm, I'm just feel like I'm not uh, the, necessarily a person to contribute to this conversation because uh, my approach to it is really, you know, I'm not a CFO or, you know, my approach to it really is as a curator. And so I'm really interested in organizing exhibitions and thinking about, you know, what, um, you know, how to sort of engage in a conversation about blockchain and and support artists through the through that um, through that avenue, right? Yeah, I appreciate that distinction. And if you know, if I could editorialize slightly, I mean, I think I appreciate you bringing up um, museums benefit auctions and additions because I I think what we are witnessing are museums wrestling with how to integrate the potential revenue source that can be derived from um, NFT works alongside their other revenue generating activities. And, you know, it's, it's nonprofits can take in earned revenue for, for those that think that that's not, not that that's not viable. That's, that's actually not the case. Many museums, uh, gift shops and other forms of earned revenues. So it is, you know, it is allowable by IRS. I think the question that Tina, you're bringing up is what's, what's the boundary or what's the line between a commercial activity and a curatorial activity. And I think that's always the um, line that museums will, will need to answer for themselves. Um, but I, I do want to shift to this new question, um, which is, Pompidou MoMA and other institutions are engaging with Web3 and F NFTs. And for each of you, in looking at what other institutions are doing to embrace artists working with emerging technology, what have you seen others doing that excites you or you hope to see more of? So I'll just toss it out for the group. Um. Uh, one thing that both MoMA and the AKG have experimented with is using POAPs, um, which is a proof of attendance protocol, which is basically a token, um, you know, an NFT um, that is given out uh, as a kind of souvenir, let's say a digital souvenir for having attended an event, whether it's uh, IRL or virtual. And so um, MoMA's um, Rafiq Anadol exhibition um, in their lobby, there was the QR code that you could scan in order to claim a PO app for having seen that show. Um, and same thing for our peer-to-peer -peer exhibition. Um, we had a PO app that people could, um, could claim for a limited amount of time. And so, you know, there's a path forward where I think we can imagine that these PO apps become integrated into um, membership programs as a way of engaging a community and pushing content to a community. Um, you know, they're fundamentally just, um, you know, digital records that might allow us to be able to um, uh, sort of track uh, our visitors in a different way or to incentivize engagement. Um, again, I'm not necessarily the right person to speak to this because I don't work in our membership department. Um, but I have to say that, you know, I think that that's, there's many ways that we can talk about the future of NFTs and museums. So one of those, you know, one of those avenues is like, you know, exhibiting or collecting artists who work with NFTs. Another avenue is using blockchains to create um, collection database records. Um, Another avenue is thinking about provenance and using NFTs as a certificate of authenticity. And another avenue would be this, you know, PO app thing. And, you know, I think for me, the I'm less maybe interested in the other avenues, except for the one about, you know, collecting and exhibiting artists who work with blockchains, obviously. Um, but I think the um, the um, the PO app model is sort of interesting. Um, the, the the major problem right now, of course, is like mainstream adoption, is that we don't have a situation where visitors walking into this museum have a crypto wallet. So offering them at point of entry a PO app for having attended today is useless, right? But I do think, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm extremely skeptical about blockchains and extremely like 
hopeful that you know there will be regulation um, in this space. Um, but that said, I don't think blockchains are totally going away. And I do think it's quite possible, I'm not gonna put money on it, but I do think it's quite possible that there's a future in which instead of having you know a paper card that you get a hole punched out of every time you go to your coffee shop and then you get five punches and you get a free coffee, that instead you'll have an app on your phone and every time you go, you scan a QR code and you get a digital record. It probably won't even be called an NFT at that point that will prove that you were there and bought something. And you know that these kinds of membership cards could be replaced by um, functionally what are blockchain-based membership programs. And so um, if those do become sort of mainstreamed, and again, I don't think we'll call them NFTs, we won't call it crypto, it'll just be an app on your phone, um, then perhaps they will become a kind of, you know, useful or interesting mechanism. And again, there's lots of sort of games we can play if you think about tokenomics and um, and sort of, you know, doing that. But um, I don't know that we're there yet. And I, you know, as in many cases, I think a lot of times it's a, it's a solution in search of a, a problem, right? So, but maybe, maybe it'll happen. America, perhaps you could answer this question from Sean Price, and I'll, I'll just read it for everyone. So the mutability of physical art allows many great works to be restored and maintained across centuries and millennia. How do your preservation departments consider NFTs, given how the vast majority of them are immutable and cannot be changed? Will a computer system know what to do with a PNG file and 700 years? Yeah, I mean, these are questions of degradation, media preservation, file formats, and um, just like compatibilities that media conservators deal with day in, day out. But what I will say is that there seems to be, at least on the museum side, like sometimes there's a misconception that when we acquire an NFT, or at least this is the way that SFMOMA has done it, <laughs> that when we acquire an NFT, we just get the files that are linked to the blockchain. And that is absolutely not true. Um, part of the process that we have developed, um, you know, has been in creating an entire system. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it a safety net, a backup plan, a contingency plan, or, or just like common sense that involves making sure that, yes, we do the NFT transfer and have our wallet set up and do all that stuff. But be beneath that, there's actually an entire infrastructure of you know, traditional legal contracts, of traditional uh, sharing of what we call source files. Just because we have an NFT in our collection doesn't mean that when the time comes to exhibit that NFT, that we're going to display it just as a monitor that casts that specific NFT because it comes back to questions and it's the same with conservation. It comes back to questions about how does the artist see that work? What is he, she, or they consider the work to begin with? And what is in the best interest of conveying the artwork and the content of it? And so to give an example, like we recently acquired seven NFTs from Alejandro Cartagena, who I'm sure you're familiar with. And we actually are in a situation where we have a physical print of the actual photographs, as well as the NFT versions of them, which is interesting because uh, you know Alejandro actually considers the NFTs as digital artist proofs of those artworks. And so we've been engaging in conversations with him of saying, like, you know, hypothetically, when we display the carpoolers, would we want to display the image of the carpooler or do we want to just cast on a screen? And so then you get into questions of, like, wouldn't it be nice to display a la Rafika Nadal, like a life size carpooler? And so with those questions in mind, our acquisition process is set up so that we don't just rely on the medium to small size PNG or JPEG that is attached to the blockchain because the, the file limit is actually quite low for them. Um, we instead engage with the artist. We develop licensing agreements. We develop everything that we need to that might not yet be covered as part of those um, smart contracts or just part of the original thinking of the minting. And we also develop procedures to make sure that we are receiving the file types that we know are going to be needed in 10 years time. So like, um, you know, the source files are, they have specific names and our media conservator works with artists to say it's an uncompressed 
lossless file, type 444, all that we receive and we ensure as part of the acquisition. It's not just like copy pasting the wallet address and receiving it. So the work of the museum in, in stewarding that artwork is way more than just receiving what you know the average user sees on the blockchain as the NFT. And that's what makes it like, so that could be immutable as much as we want, but we have um, strategies in place to make sure that as the file types evolve and compatibility change, we are not pigeonholed to whatever is tied to the blockchain. So Can I just, oh, sorry, Hesse. I'm just gonna say, it looks like there's two follow-up questions or one follow-up question and one, you know, comment. Um, can you, I can read those if, if you can't see them. I can see it. And to answer the last one in terms of what, then what's the point of collecting the NFT? Again, it it doesn't, it, it's not like a holistic philosophical approach that we take to NFTs. It's kind of like what Tina was saying of like, is it a medium? Is it anything else? I, I actually don't see NFTs as a medium. I think many times for many artists, NFTs are a medium. But for many others, it's not, right? For many others, it's a documentation uh, mechanism. For others, it could be a proof. For others, it could be many different interpretations. And so part of the excitement of working on this is also having that flexibility and adapting to however the artist actually sees NFT, like blockchain technology and NFTs fitting into their practice. It's not a one solution fits all. So for many of them, it could be, especially the newer generation of NFT artists that work solely as a digitally native um, source file that is that is the nft is the artwork we respect that you know and if the artist comes to us and says we don't want to give source files all you can do is just put a qr code to the to the url then that's what we do we respect the artist's um, intention but if the artist wants to make sure that it is a magnificent magnificent display then we have those conversations to try to encourage artists to also think of questions that a lot of times living artists don't think about in terms of 50 years time or 100 years time, they're probably, you know, thinking about the now. Some are thinking long term, but it's our role to kind of guide those conversations and make sure that they understand also the magnitude of their work coming into the collection. I hope I answered those questions. <laughs> Tina, did you have a follow up to that? Um, yeah, I was just going to flag, you know, to say that these these questions that are popping up. Yeah, I mean, this is why I've had a phrase for several years, which is that the NFT is neither necessary nor sufficient for a museum acquisition, right? I mean, um, yeah, for all the reasons that America just pointed out, right? Um, uh, that when we acquired works that are tokenized, which is the sort of phrase that I like to prefer, um, uh, that, you know, thinking that these are digital artworks that you know, in most cases happen to have been attached to an NFT. Um, we requested additionally a certificate of authenticity. We requested additionally the, you know, uncompressed original artwork files, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so then the question is, is like, is the NFT even useful at all? And so I think, you know, that's an answer that, I mean, I'm, yeah, you can probably figure out that in, in most cases, I, I think it's probably not. Um, but that's not to say that there's not a future in which, um, you know, they, they could be used uh, for all of these reasons for provenance, et cetera. Um, I, and basically to say that I'm, I'm most interested at this point in, you know, the NFT as a um, as a creative medium in which people are really making, you know, what um, uh, some people have referred to as wallet art or like, you know, um, or um, like smart contract art or something where really it is about the transaction that happens between wallets, for example, it's almost like an act of relational aesthetics. Um, so Rhea Myers is like the classic example of an artist who's really interested with the smart contract as a medium. Um, the work that's now in the AKG's collection by um, Simon Denny is another example of a work that is really about uh, like blockchain wallets and the transactions between wallets. Um, so, you know, I, I think that in those cases, like as America said, like it's not a one size fits all answer. Like in those cases, what it means to archive those works properly, given that the work is really exists in a smart contract or on the blockchain in a really philosophically profound kind of way, 
you know, that work has to be handled differently. And I think that then you get into a whole host of questions that have already been explored, you know, for a long time now by leading time-based media conservators. I just want to call out Regina Harsanyi, who's the curator at the Museum of the Moving Image, who has done so much, and you should all follow her on Twitter if you want, like, great information about all of this. Um, but, uh, you know, really philosophical questions explored by the TBM conservation field having to do with, like, documentation versus migration um, and the question of, like, performativity and variability and thinking about is there even a point at which media artworks die right because they can't continue to be um you know shown in emulated software environments etc cetera, etc cetera. um but this is way too much to get into uh at the yeah. supposed end of this conversation but I mean, I yes, it's an ongoing question um but it is not one that does not have answers and i don't think it's you know i don't think that we should avoid you know, as institutions, um, we should avoid these works because of our fear or inexperience, right? That we need to commit in the same way that museums had to learn how to deal with photography and develop collection care protocols and figure out what is the amount of exposure that a photograph can take if we want to keep that photographic print, you know, in, you know, um, in good condition for the next several centuries, right? I mean, like we had to figure that out. And I think that, you know, we're figuring all that out right now for digital. Thank you for making that correlation. And just to observe that, you know, these questions regarding preservation are, are certainly not unique to NFT works or works in the blockchain. I mean, if, you know, typically when a museum acquires a photograph, they might actually acquire two prints, one, one that goes in the freezer and one that gets framed. Um, you know, Matthew Barney's first works on video were produced on Laserdisc, which, like, you know, there's a certain point they have to be reproduced. And it's about the, it's about the contract, not about the physical object. Um, so, you know, it, it's really difficult to go down that, um, that thread of what will the physical form or digital form of an NFT look like in five, 10, 15 years. And of course, for, for us at CAM, we're a non-collecting museum. So we're, for the most part, um, off the hook on that question. Sorry, I was just trying to type a response to the last question. And then I, apparently I can only give a voice response. It like unmuted me. I didn't know um, that's how that would work. But somebody just pointed out that the California DMV is already using blockchain for car titles, which I did not know. And I was just going to say, thank you so much for sharing. This is already like a real world application of blockchain. And the question is, you know, in the future would, you know, do we see all COAs moving to being blockchain based? And it's like, I don't know. I don't know yet. We're not there yet. Um, but that's not to say that we may not be in the future. And to go back to that article I was citing by Andre Shanto and Thomas Campbell, like, you know, there is an opportunity here for museums to sort of, I mean, museums have always been so like derriere guard when it comes to technology um, with the exception of some like brilliant forward thinking curators and, um, you know, museum workers who work in, um, you know, digital assets or communications or whatever. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, we haven't really been ahead of the ball on tech. And so it would be interesting to think about, you know, again, what it looks like for museums to be a space in which we can sort of test this stuff out or at least have a conversation about it but um you know the the technology is not there yet and we'd have to answer a lot of questions um about long-term sustainability about like the oracle problem in which you know how do we verify that the information that gets on the blockchain in the first place is trusted and accurate i mean there's like a whole host of questions right and it's not to say they're not answerable but it's just an ongoing question I didn't want to go back. There's there's a final question in one of the um, comments above, and, and it's, do each of you see NFTs slash the blockchain and the developments in recent years as a sort of digital, you know, quote unquote, renaissance? And how might we look back on this moment in 5, 10, 20 years and see the artist at the forefront of experimenting and innovating in this form? I mean, I think I, I do feel that that's a useful way to frame the moment that we're witnessing and just love to hear each of your thoughts quickly on that. And I know we're nearly coming to time. So 
Sure, so um, I can tackle that since I'm the sort of resident art historian here. Um, my impulse is always to be the historian and to say digital artists never stop making digital art or artists never stop making work digitally um, just because the market you know, has um, not necessarily had sustained interest in the work that they make or just because the sort of like mainstream art press, I mean, it's like, I always joke, like I'm old enough to remember, but like with all this whole discourse that exploded yesterday on the internet around Apple's introduction of the Vision Pro, and then, you know, this wave of conversation that's going to happen about AR and VR art. And I was like, I'm old enough to remember when Artsy published an article in 2016 saying that virtual reality was the greatest medium of our time, you know, and even before that, when, um, you know, like post-internet art, and then before that with net art, and, you know, it's like there, I mean, Hell, Playboy was publishing articles about computer generated art in 1965. I mean, like there's been a long history of artists working digitally who, you know, have found audiences and and had attention. And then the art world, you know, it is to a certain extent, or at least the art market and sort of like the mainstream art discourse, you know, it is a certain to a certain extent about um, the kinds of fashions and trends, right? So things are cyclical. Um, so uh, yes, I take your point that it definitely feels like right now there's a lot of energy and excitement. There's more financial opportunity with certain limitations on that, right? I don't want to overstate the case, but um, you know, uh, there are new methods of working in the sense that you can, you know, have these smart contracts now as a medium. But um, you know, the history of generative art, for example, even long form generative art, I mean, we're talking about something that's 60 years old at this point. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess it also, I, I should really turn it around and say what, you know, when you say Renaissance, there's a difference between talking about the market, like you're talking about, you know, having to have proper provenance, proving ownership, you know, I'm assuming making money is part of that. That's sort of one part of the conversation, but then another conversation is what does the art look like? Is there a Renaissance here? in the sense of, you know, new aesthetic forms emerging, um, a lot of great work being produced, finding new audiences, all of that. Um, and I would say that, you know, it's been really nice to, um, you know, the fact that there has been so much public attention on it, but I, you know, have always expressed from the beginning a bit of concern that when the conversation gets dominated by a very particular kind of digital art, um, that there's a kind of flattening that's happening, right? That we're, we're forgetting history, but we're also elevating certain kinds of practices over others. And for me, what is so exciting about digital art is the richness of all of the different ways that artists can work, whether it's abstract, figurative, conceptual, generative, um, you know, whether they're making works that are interactive or, or static. I mean, there's just, you know, it's not really one thing. Um, and so, yeah, I just hope that all of this hype um, you know, doesn't lead to kind of a crash or a flattening of the horizons of possibility for artists who work with technology. Which is why I do panels like this, just to keep all of that stuff in conversation still. Tony, America? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I can't speak to the art of it. Uh, I think Tina did a great job of, of discussing the art, but I, I would say, you know, from a technological standpoint, I would definitely say that this is a, um, a critical juncture where, where we have um, sort of a, a new uh, decentralized method, right? Um, going from, from primarily centralized um, uh, storage and, 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 and smart contracts have, Change, sort of change how we can apply that to, to many things. Obviously, this, this discussion is about art, and we're seeing how that is implemented. Um, so I, you know, whether or not it's a renaissance, I don't know, but I think it's definitely a, a, a turning point in in technology and how we use this new technology and apply it across uh, various facets of our lives. I also don't know about the term renaissance. I think, well, there's a lot of connotations that come with it as well. But I do think it is exciting to see emerging technologies, whether they're completely different or completely new audiences or not, and have a moment where there is a bit of a, you know, re-engaged interest in a lot of the questions that did come about with digital art. And for us, at least at SMOMA, I think one of the more exciting things has been not just NFTs because NFTs are exciting. They are, you know, no shade at all. Um, but I think 
using them also this moment of people having conversations about these questions of like what is art anyway <laughs> um, and what is a museum like all those things I think have brought us back to a lot of um, the core tenants that were you know at the start of like the founding of our media arts department and the founding of our architecture and design department when we were collecting you know the your Lenny's and the Casey Reese moments like all of that I think um, I'm not saying that it died down but I think that in in a particular moment in our history, there definitely was a lot more interest for us to collect a certain type of art and to be able to talk about that type of art, but we were not necessarily able to engage with it as much as we wanted to. A lot of it had to do with the price of the artworks and just the availability of the artworks um, for us to be able to do it. And so it's really exciting now that NFTs are kind of emerging and um, becoming a lot more ubiquitous to use that also as a bouncing off platform to revitalize a lot of things that, you know, we would have liked to had the resources to be able to pursue with much stronger force. <laughs> thank you. And I, I just have to thank you all. I mean, I think to go back to one of Tina's very early comments that we're really all engaged in the larger project and question of what's next. And, you know, for museums, our role is, as you said, not necessarily to direct the future, but rather to engage with artists about imagining the future. So I want to thank you all for this conversation. It's been fascinating and enriching for me, and I, I hope for the audience as well. Yeah, and I just want to echo Hesse's thanks to everyone, all of the panelists, um, for a really thoughtful, engaging, informative um, discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us and for really great questions also. Thank you. Um, and just a few final notes. This panel was recorded, um, so we will be uploading a recording of it um, to our website, assembly.art. Um, so you can revisit it or share it around. Um, and as I said, the exhibition Collecting the Future is on view until July 22nd. Um, and you should also mark your calendars for July 14th, which will be um, another amazing panel discussion, this time between um, some of the artists featured in the exhibition. Um, so please join us on July 14th. More info coming soon. Um, and that is all. Thank you, everyone, again. And please enjoy the rest of your Tuesdays. Thank you all.